Churches of Christ present Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. Kendall, and I am one of the evangelists at the Nettleton Church of Christ. Uh, we are grateful that you have decided to tune in and, and to be with us today to be encouraged uh, from the words that are said, which has their foundation in God's holy and divine word. We will speak where the Bible speaks, and we will be silent where the Bible is silent. If we say something that is not according to Scripture or something with which you disagree, we plead with you to call us. My cell phone number is 870-919-0041. Call me. Let's uh, hash the things that I say out, uh, reason through the Scripture, and we will come to a knowledge of what God has to say. I am willing to admit when I am wrong. If I have something wrong, I will admit it. Uh, but I need to. it needs to have its proof in God's Word. So please um, make that known. Let's get into our lesson today. Today I want to ask the question and then I want to set out to answer it and the question is can a Christian fall from the grace of God so as to be eternally lost in hell? Can a Christian fall from the grace of God so as to be eternally lost in hell? Now there are denominational sects that will tell you no that one can never fall from the grace of God so as to be eternally lost. It is a doctrine known as once saved, always saved. Now on the surface, I want to make it known that that is utterly and absolutely false. The Bible does not um, give a, a, an ounce uh, of hope for a person who believes and embraces the doctrine of once saved, always saved. It is a dangerous doctrine and it needs to be refuted. God's Word has the answer. So my, my purpose, my aim today is to prove that a Christian can fall from the grace of God so as to be eternally lost in hell, but it is possible to prevent that from happening. It is possible to prevent that from happening. Now, again, I say, as I've said, many folks, many sincere folks, genuine folks, believe this doctrine. The bottom line is they have been mistaken and they get their source outside of the Bible. A lot of people reason subjectively. What do I mean by reasoning subjectively? They look inside of themselves for truth, their heart, their feelings, um, and so forth. They also look to the wrong objective standard. When I look at something objectively, I'm looking outside of myself for the truth. The thing is, we need to make sure we're looking at the right objective standard. 
Some folks look to their preacher. Preacher, tell me, what does this say? What does this mean? And without confirming it with God's Word, they readily accept it. All right, so we need to make sure that whatever objective standard to which we adhere is the correct one. The objective standard is God. God has the final say on every issue. We must let Him have the final say. The doctrine of once saved, always saved, and I don't know if, if many of us might not know this, originated from a man by the name of John Calvin. John Calvin, who lived back in the 14th, 15th century. Um, 14, 1500s, excuse me. Uh, John Calvin uh, promoted this doctrine, and many have just embraced it through the years. And the central idea of Calvinism focused around the sovereignty of God. What is the sovereignty of God? The idea is the overruling power of God. I believe in the sovereignty of God. We better believe in the sovereignty of God. The Bible teaches it. But what John Calvin did is he isolated the sovereignty of God. He isolated the sovereignty of God. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? He exalted the sovereignty of God to the exclusion of other truths. All right, like for instance, God is love. Is He love? Absolutely. Matter of fact, that's His overriding characteristic. But He's also a God of wrath. Is God only a God of love and wrath? No, He's a God of mercy. He's a God of long suffering. I can't take one truth in the Bible and fully embrace that and obey it to the exclusion of other truths. I have to put all of the truths of the Bible together and whatever truth come, uh, that I get from putting all the truths together is the final truth. You see, that's what people do. They rip things out of its context. Okay? They'll, um, they'll, they'll read a passage to the, uh, and they'll isolate it. They won't consider the, uh, the verses before, the verses after, the chapters before. They won't consider the purpose of the book. They have biased ideas. They come in with a, uh, uh, studying the Bible with prejudice and so forth. So, moving on with, this, with John Calvin's uh, doctrine, um, what he would say is he would say if God is absolutely sovereign, then it follows that salvation depends, notice, entirely on God and not man. You find that, incidentally, in a man-made creed known as the Westminster Confession of Faith. That's not the Bible. It says too much. There are five basic tenets of Calvinism, and it is understood under an, a famous acronym known as the TULIP Doctrine. Okay, the T stood for, and still stands for, total hereditary depravity. Okay, and what it means is, at birth, all men are morally corrupt. Why? Because they have inherited sin, okay, all the way back from Adam and Eve. The U stands for unconditional election. Unconditional election, which meant before the foundation of the world, okay, before the world was ever created, God randomly chose to save some and to destroy some, and the ones that are saved can do nothing to be lost, and the ones that are lost can, be nothing, can do nothing to be saved. Well, if, I was, if one was chosen before the foundation of the world, how would they know that they have been chosen? Who gets to determine, or uh, um, where do they find out whether or not they have been chosen? That's the question. The L stood for limited atonement, which taught Christ died only for the ones that were unconditionally elected. The I stood for irresistible grace. That is, there's nothing you can do to overcome or resist whether or not you have been unconditionally elected. And then there's perseverance of the saints. Uh, the P stood for perseverance of the saints, which taught, since man can do nothing but evil on his own, God unconditionally elected, or God's unconditional election is required. Therefore, one needs to do nothing to remain saved. Also understood as once saved, always saved. Now, I'm going to say something. And I want you to really focus on what I'm saying. A pleasant lie is usually more desirable than
an unpleasant truth. It just sounds more appeasing and more pleasant to know that when I'm saved, I can never lose my salvation. That gives me now, and I know these folks that believe this won't go so far to say this, but they, they have to. It, it necessitates them to say this, that a person can do now anything, whether bad or good. It doesn't matter, and, they never, and they're never going to be lost. That is what once saved, always saved means. Once and always saved. That's it. It's a pleasant lie. It certainly sounds good. I mean, I would buy it if I didn't know what the Bible taught. And many people are buying it. Now, let's look what the Bible has to say. You go all the way back to the Old Testament. God through the prophet Hosea. God who the prophet Hosea. I want you to see what he had to say uh, to this great, or to, the, to his people uh, through this great prophet. Hosea 11. Verse 7, notice what he said. Here's what he said, Hosea, verse, Hosea 11, 7. And my people are bent to backsliding from me. I want you to hear it now. Are you listening? My people, people who belong to me, who have, who, who have done the things necessary to enter into a covenant relationship with me, my people are bent to what? Backsliding. Sliding back. Okay, let's keep reading. Though they call, though they called them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. So his people were bent on backsliding. Those people that were bent on backsliding and who went on to backslide, are they saved when they are when at, uh, as they're backsliding, or are they lost? Now, just remember, if you say they're saved, you have to say that one who backslides and leaves God is saved. Now, are you willing to admit that? That's a, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty arrogant attitude if you are. Basically, you're saying, I don't need God. I, I can slide away from God and still be saved. I mean, who, who, who would have the audacity to believe such foolishness? So, you go into Deuteronomy chapter 8, just looking at some Old Testament uh, principles. Deuteronomy 8, and I want you to look at verse 11. Deuteronomy 8. Um, let's look at verse of Deuteronomy 8. I, I want you to consider verse 11. Deuteronomy 8. Now here's what God told those in a covenant relationship with Him. Okay, and by the way, saved folks. Now He says, verse 11, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, in not keeping His commandments and His judgments and His statutes which I command thee this day. Why the warning if there's, no impo if there's no possibility? Why would God go so far to say beware, give a warning, if there's no possibility to be lost? Here's saved folks. God says beware. Beware of what? Going back. What's the point if there's no possibility? Listen, if I'm saved and I'm always saved, why heed any warnings? Because if I decide not to heed the warning, I've been unconditionally elected, I'm always saved, so whether or not I heed the warning, I'm saved. It doesn't matter. Right? I mean, you have, to, you have to agree with that. If not, why not? If not, why not? Okay? Now we get to the New Testament, and we simply ask the question, is it possible? It's, I give a resounding yes. Look at John, um, or I'm sorry, look at Luke chapter 8, verse 13. We have Jesus teaching the parable of the sower, the parable of the seed, uh, the parable of the soils, how, however you want to label this parable. It's a famous uh, parable about which we all know. Luke 8, verse 13. Here's Jesus describing certain soils which represented people. Verse 13, he said, They on the rock, the soil on the rock, are they which when they hear, okay, they hear the word, receive the word, how? With joy. Receive it with joy. And these have no root. Are you, now, friends, you, you, you got to listen. Which for a while believe. Which for a while believe. Are believers saved? Okay and in time of temptation, fall away. Question for those who believe, 
You cannot fall from grace. You cannot lose your salvation. Those who believe in the doctrine of once saved, always saved are these folks who believed and fell away. Are they saved or lost? If I fall away, am I saved or lost? Something to certainly think about. Well, here's John 15 now. There's one scripture out of many. That should be enough. If God said it once, that's enough for me. I hope it is for you. But, of course, you're going to have your naysayers and you're going to have those who want more proof, those who are set on whatever they believe. Look at John chapter 15. And here's Jesus now speaking to his disciples exclusively in the upper room just not the night before his crucifixion. And he's describing himself as the true vine and his disciples are the branches. Look what he says in verse 5, uh, verse five of John 15. Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same, for, or the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. But notice verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth, as a branch is cast forth and is withered and then men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. I want you to notice the language here. They're cast forth, all right? They're withered because there's no moisture and then they're burned. What comes to your mind when you think about being burned? Annihilation, possibly. Ashes, completely destroyed. These folks are believers, but they're cast forth because they, they, they stop somewhere along the line abiding in Jesus' doctrine, and then they're burned. Are those folks saved or are they lost? You know what you'd have to say, right? If you believe these folks are saved, then you can be saved by not abiding in the doctrine of Jesus. Again, who has the audacity to make such a bold statement. Now let's go even more far. That's the potential of apostasy. But you know, there are actually those who have fallen and who have went, and who have went to the Hadean realm, the torment side of the Hadean realm, and who are going to be judged to hell someday. The scriptures teach it. Look at Judas. Judas is scary. All right? Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter 125 because you know the argument that folks are going to use. All right? But look at Acts 125. True or false, Judas was at one time saved. Okay? Whether he knew it or not, whether he knew he was going to leave or whatever, at one time he was actually one who was healing folks, who was doing miracles, who, who was teaching folks the gospel. Here's a saved individual at one time in his life. Look at Acts chapter 125. In Acts chapter 125, here is Judas who has already betrayed Jesus, has already hung himself, and so forth. And the apostles are going through the process of choosing another one. Look at verse 25. That he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. Transgression fell. That he might go to his own place. What would be his own place? Heaven or hell? Well, he fell by transgression. So therefore, he'd go to hell. Someone would say, that's not good enough. All right. Well, for me it is, but for those that say it's not good enough, I, I, let's look at something else. You go over to John chapter 17 and you look at verse 12. John says about Judas, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that gaveth me, Jesus speaking, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be filled. Here's Judas, once saved, is now referred to as the son of perdition. Do you know what that word perdition means? It means utterly destroyed. Utterly destroyed. Utterly destroyed where? in torment now in the Hadean realm, and on the judgment day, once the sentence is made, he's going to be utterly destroyed in hell. The fact of the matter is you have a saved individual who ended up lost. If not, why not? Bring your challenges, bring your, your, your reasoning, but there's no way of getting around that point. There's also two others, Hymenius and Philetus. 
2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul writing to his young son of the faith, 2 Timothy 2. Let's get there. 2 Timothy 2, verse 16 and 18. Here's Paul writing to Timothy, and he says, But shun profane but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Verse 17, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. Two individuals are mentioned. Who concerning the truth have erred, have erred or erred, however you want to say the word, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Do you see what's being said here? Concerning the truth have erred. That means they have went off into error. You know what that would imply? That they once were in the truth. Somewhere along the line they went off. But I want you to see what they're doing. They're overthrowing the faith of some. How can you overthrow someone's faith if they never had faith? Here's folks who had faith. Their faith is being overthrown because of false doctrine that Hymenius and Philetus is throwing around concerning the resurrection. Here's folks who were saved and now they're lost. If not, why not? You also go to 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20, you find that um, Hymenius and Alexander, oh wow, look at this. Look at the First Timothy 1, verse 20. The Bible says, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan. Are these folks that have been... Del- if you're delivered unto Satan, are you saved or are you lost? Can you be saved being delivered to Satan? And here's inspiration saying this. Folks... The only way we can draw the conclusion that you can't ever lose your salvation is if we listen to the denominational dogmas that are out there. I have to. One more example. Because it's going to be the bread and butter of the Baptist church. The bread and butter of the Baptist church is Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. And I believe Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But I don't believe it according to the Baptist dogma. Because the Baptist dogma adds to the context of Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and, and utterly just twists it. Twist, twists it. I, I guess I said that right. They pervert it. We might be a better way of say it. Ephesians 2, verse 8. Notice what Paul said. He said, For by grace are you saved through faith. All right? Grace, I'm saved through my faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. All right? You see here, you're saved by grace. You can't be saved on your own merit. You're saved by grace through your own faith. You can't ever lose your salvation. To whom is Paul writing? He's writing to the church at Ephesus. Is he not? The the book of Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus. You ready to do this? Go to Revelation 2. Look at Revelation 2 and verse 4. Revelation 2 verse 4. Jesus here says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Speaking to the church at Ephesus. Years later. Because thou hast left thy first love. Okay? Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 2. He says, you're saved. Here they are in Revelation 2. Jesus himself said they left their first love. If you leave your first love, which is a reference to Jesus, do you, are you saved or are you lost? If I leave Jesus, I'm lost. I can't be saved without Jesus. Jesus is the one in, uh, through whom I have to go in order for me to get to the Father. So it takes Jesus. They left Him. Are they saved or lost? That's not it. Look at verse 5. The church at Ephesus, who according to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 are saved, says now in verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Now he says you're fallen because you left your first love. What do you got to do? Repent? Why repent if I'm not lost? Why repent if I'm always saved? I was saved here. Well, now do I, why do I have to repent? Because I, I'm always saved. Friends, it should be that simple. We're running out of time. What I want to do is next week we're going to see why people fall. Why people fall. Tune in next week. Thank you so much for your attention today.
have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Jesus saves, Jesus saves.